Welcome to Social Elo Ministries, where we are committed to glorifying God while exposing the devil. I have spent quite a bit of time going through the Bible. And the most profound lesson that I've learned about the Bible that I can summarize in one statement is that the Bible shows me how much I and you, how much we need a Savior. And that Savior is Jesus. So again, one of the most profound lessons, arguably the most profound lessons I've learned in the Bible, is how badly we need a Savior in Jesus. There are times when I see Christians, and they're well-meaning individuals. And for example, they start doing things to go back to the law. And not truly... And not truly enjoying the grace that Jesus died to give to us. And the law is indicative of works. And even those 613 laws, th those laws showed the people how badly they needed a savior. Because they failed miserably at fulfilling those laws, at meeting those laws. And even the people who were um, in charge of upholding the law, like the Pharisees and Sadducees, when Jesus showed up, they knew the letter of the law, but they didn't know the spirit of the law. We have to be careful that we're truly enjoying the grace that Jesus died to give to us. And I could say capitalize, but the thing is, some things are a free gift. However, Jesus paid the price for that gift. So we have to be careful about the things that the Lord died to cleanse us from, to free us from, and how, in a sense, we repay him for those things. So again, the most profound lesson I've learned in the entire Bible is how badly we need a Savior. And the moment you think that you can do it by yourself, through your works, is the moment you are going to fail. The Pharisees and Sadducees thought they were on their way to heaven. And Jesus called them children of hell. There are some religions, some Christian denominations, or so-called Christian denominations, that are so focused on doing works, they're trying to do it on their own, and they're failing. Some of those individuals are using drugs and alcohol to try to maintain the veneer of perfection. And they can't even voice their imperfection to others because like, they may get ostracized because it's a works-based system. We need a savior. We cannot do it on our own. And then there are those who feel as if they are perfect. And I'm going to cover some things to let you know. One of the reasons why we need a savior is that we may think that we have done everything great. And then Jesus shows us a standard that we have been failing to meet and didn't even know about it. And if he judges us on that higher standard, we will never get into heaven. So again, the most profound lesson I've learned in the Bible is how badly we all need a Savior in Jesus. In 1 John 1, verse 6 through 10, it states, If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth, us from all sin. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, God's Son, cleanseth us from all sins. His blood, His blood only. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Again, if we confess our sins, 
he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. <clears throat> I kind of pause for a second. There are times when I'll present information, but I won't get into debates about it. Because, yes, if there's a mistake I made, I am open to correction. But certain debates, I am not going to get into. Because, one, I feel as if the information I'm sharing is that I'm being led by the Holy Spirit of the Lord. There are times, I'll just say, where people can rub scriptures together and come up with a great sermon. They can prove a point. But that point is not always applicable to what the Holy Spirit of the Lord is saying. There are also times when people will put scriptures together. It flows real well. But at the end of it, they're putting people in bondage. And kind of like I said, it is by God's grace, with him sending his son, that we make it. There are sometimes people are putting themselves in bondage by holding themselves to a higher standard. That is great. If you can accomplish it, by all means. Personally speaking, I know I've been a recipient of God's grace and his mercy, symbols of his love, many times over. And for as long as I live, I'll probably need it even more times. There are some people who, in a sense, they kind of reject God's love, mercy, and grace. And that's fine. But you're missing out. But at the same point, like I said before, Jesus paid the price. And we cannot dishonor him by taking certain things for granted. And I'll cover that too. Turn to Galatians um, 2, verses 15 through 16. And the Apostle Paul said, We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith of Jesus Christ. I'll repeat the one sentence again, or a couple of clauses again. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. At the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Again, we need a Savior in Christ. I'm going to need some water for this next segment. In Acts 15, starting the first verse, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. That's an example of how well-intended people come across doing things, but they're putting people in bondage, creating obstacles. Basically being a stumbling block in people getting to Jesus. So again, except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. But is that what God said? When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other men should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. Okay, they were going to the other apostles. One of the things, sometimes when I present things and I know it's going to be controversial, I'm very careful to let you know, seek the Lord about your specific situation. Jesus, he's our personal Lord and Savior, which is why we have to seek him with our own personal situation. There are times when people... They may get out of bondage with a certain message, and they may get back into bondage with a certain message. But they're not 
checking with the Lord to ensure that is what he is saying to them. Because just because you hear something does not mean it applies to you. And to continue, and being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenice and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God hath done with them. But there rose up... <laughs> I see the word Pharisee or Pharisees, and even today that has bad connotation because there are people who are like Pharisees. They're kind of so rigidly adhered to the law that they truly cannot see God's grace or how the Lord gives his grace to people in certain situations. Even situations where it may seem where actually situations where it contradicts one scripture, but they don't realize that there's another scripture where it allows the Lord's grace to work. So it may seem as if the Lord is contradicting his own words, but there is another message somewhere that gives us that grace. So it's not just important to know the letter of the law, but in a sense we have to know the spirit of the law. Not just know the words in the Bible, but also the spirit that inspired the Bible. And that is the Holy Spirit of the Lord. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying that it is needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. To command them to keep the law of Moses. <laughs> and the apostles and elders came together for, the con for to consider this matter. And when there had been much disputing, There have been, are, and will be conflicts within Christianity. And in some cases, that is fine. As long as we don't lose sight of Christ, the only begotten Son, who God sent to pay the price of our sins. He was sent, he lived on earth, gave up his life, sacrificed for our sins, he was rose from the dead on the third day and then he ascended into heaven about a month later. As long as we don't lose sight of that, we have to be careful that we don't get in vain arguments, discussions that have very little impact on our salvation. So again, and when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, men and brethren, Ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that we, correction, that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we are able to bear? It's almost like I could stop right there. Do not put yokes on yourselves that people from the past could not bear, and people in the present cannot bear, and people in the future cannot bear. Jesus paid the price. It is like receiving a gift card for some free groceries. You're starving, but you never use the gift card. I'll say that again. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why tempt ye God? To put a yoke upon the necks of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we are able to bear. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord, Jesus Christ, we shall be saved, even as they. Then all the multitude, <coughs> 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 
Then all the multitude kept silent and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. Acts 15. I'll read verses 10 and 11 again. Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. Yes, we are expected to do some things. The Bible even tells us that faith without works is dead. But it's not just about works. It requires faith in Jesus. And I am a man of the Old and New Testament. I believe in the entire Bible from Genesis all the way to Revelation. And in Isaiah 64, verse 6, we're reminded of this, and especially anyone who's like a Pharisee who, who thinks that by works that he or she can make it into heaven without God's grace, without having a Savior in Christ Jesus. So um, Isaiah 64, 6. But we are all as unclean thing, but we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags and we all do fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away so by our own works we're like filthy rags regardless how righteous we think we are filthy rags God is far holy than any of us can imagine We need Jesus, the blood that he spilled, that cleanses our sins. It is through him that we gain that righteousness, <laughs> only through him. There's more, but again, the most profound lesson I've learned while going through the Bible several times over is how much we need a Savior in Christ Jesus. <sighs> Matthew 5. Jesus said some profound words. We're at face value. If it was just by our works, he could close the gates of heaven and none of us would make it in. And some people, they put themselves, they put that yoke around their necks, almost asking to be judged on a level far higher than they can meet. In Matthew 5, verses 20 through um, 28, Jesus, our judge, and Savior said, For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case, excuse me, enter into the kingdom of heaven. So again, for I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. See? Jesus can judge us on a standard that is so high that we cannot make it. And we may think that we're righteous. But when he pulls out those standards, we know we cannot make it without him. So you may say, I've never murdered anyone. <laughs> but if you're angry with your brother without cause, you're in danger of judgment. 
Jesus was equating it with murder. Again, our righteousness counts for nothing without Jesus. And whosoever shall, whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Hmm. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Agree with thine adversary quickly, whilst thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge delivered thee to the officer, and cast, and thou be cast into prison. Verily I say unto you, <clears throat> or verily I say unto thee, thou shalt by no means come out thence, till thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. Ye have heard that in time, <laughs> ye have heard that it was said by them of old time that thou shalt not Commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery already in his heart. It continues with some more things. By all means, you're more than welcome to read Matthew 5 for the rest of it. But some people are saying that they've never committed adultery. But Jesus is saying that if you've looked at someone lustfully, You've already committed adultery. It's kind of like, wow. So again, we need Jesus. And even though Jesus said this about committing adultery, especially back in those times, the penalty for committing adultery was death. Yet in John 8, verses 1 through 11, we see an example of God's grace. Because there are times when the devil... He will get you into a situation and he gets you there because it's like a trap door where in a sense you go down a slippery slope, you slide into a trap door and you're unable to come out. And you will be without Christ. There are times when the devil will think that he has you pinned down and he can find scripture to tell you that you are now condemned because you got into that situation. Whether you knew it or not, whether you were willing or not, you are now condemned because you got into that situation. And we, but we have to remember, there's a God. So again, Jesus is talking about adultery and how he even mentioned adultery, just looking at someone lustfully is committing adultery. Yet in John 8, we see how the Pharisees, they tried tempting Jesus by bringing a woman to him who had been caught committing adultery. She and the man she was with should have been stoned to death. That was the law. Yet, we see an example of God's grace. When even though Jesus is against committing adultery, even to the point where he doesn't want you looking at someone lustfully, yet the woman was caught in the very act of adultery. And what did Jesus end up doing? Finding a way for her to get out of that situation. And he told her that since no one condemns her, that he does not, did not condemn her either. However, he told her to go and sin no more. See, there are times when you find things in the Bible that will tell you that if you do this, you are stuck forever. You have to ride this one out, so to speak. But if the Lord sets you free, remember who the Son sets free is free indeed. That woman, yes, she had to live with the guilt of what she was caught doing. But she had to also live knowing that through God's grace, he allowed her to live. She could testify about his grace. But his grace is not a reason to sin. His grace is not a reason to continue sinning. Because like Jesus said, go and sin no more. There are times when the devil will get you in a bind. And there are times when you kind of get yourself in a bind. But whether it's you or him or the both of you, you get in the bind. You can cry on the name of Jesus. And if he gets you out, know that you're free. Do not let anyone come to you quoting scriptures trying to put you back in bondage. 
you need to have a direct relationship with the Lord that when he tells you something, that is what you go with. That lady, John 8, she should have been stoned to death. But Jesus set her free. When the Lord sets you free, do not let anyone put you in bondage. And please, do not put yourself in bondage. In Luke 4, we see an example of how the devil, he used scriptures in his attempt to tempt Jesus. The devil knows the Bible. He can put together scriptures and you make a great sermon, or it sounds great. But you have to have the relationship with the Lord to know when he is addressing your situation. When the Lord sets you free, be free. But it's not free for you to continue sinning. It's freedom for you to stop sinning. Because also in John 5, 14, Jesus had healed a lame man, but he told him to go and sin no more, let something worse overtake him. So do not play games with God. Peter, in Acts 15, he mentioned about why tempt God. And a part of the reason why that woman was free after committing adultery was because the Pharisees were tempting God. So don't tempt God. When he sets you free, you have to leave the life of sin behind. What's where he set you free from? You may not, it may not go well for you next time. So don't play games with God. But the Lord, he's a God of second, sometimes third, fourth chances. And also part of the reason why he set that woman free. In Exodus 33, verse 19, the Lord and Moses had an interaction and the Lord is going to pass it for Moses. And he said that he was going to proclaim his name before him. And then he said, basically that I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy. God is full of grace. He's full of mercy. But don't tempt him. Don't play games with him. When he sets you free, run away from whatever he set you free from. Don't let anyone pull you back into that mess. But do not take God's grace for granted. If nothing else, remember he paid the price. He suffered immensely. He was scourged. The flesh ripped off the bones before even carrying the cross to Calvary no, much less the time that he spent on the cross so don't lose sight of that but remember God's grace and I close this exhortation with this one scripture and I hope that if you've been subject to bondage spiritual oppression, even well-intended people trying to put you back in bondage with, with scriptures. But the Lord has freed you. I hope you'll walk away from that bondage. And two things. Prophets point people to Jesus in many ways. Joseph he was in slavery and prison for 13 years. But when Pharaoh called him, he cleaned himself up and he took his prison clothes off. <laughs> and he never put those clothes back on again. He walked away from his past. Jesus, after he was crucified, when Mary Magdalene and later on Peter and John went by his tomb, his grave clothes were left behind. In fact, Lazarus, when he came out of the, the grave, Jesus told him to take his burial clothes off. Please, take your burial clothes off. Take your burial clothes off. Take your prison clothes off. Live in the grace that the Lord died and paid for. In Romans 8, verse 1, There is therefore 
now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. I say again, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. You have to know when a person comes to you, what spirit that person is coming to you with. In Matthew 7, verses 21 through 23, Jesus talked about people coming to him saying, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name? Do many wonderful works in your name? And Jesus will tell them that he never knew them. It is one thing to know the words of the Lord, but you also have to know the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord, and what he's doing in your life. I mentioned about adultery earlier. Even in the Old Testament, when David committed adultery with Bathsheba, he and Bathsheba should have been killed. The Lord punished him, but he forgave him. The Lord punished him, but he forgave him. David is a recipient of God's grace. And when you go through the rest of the Bible, you don't hear about David committing adultery anymore. He learned a hard lesson. There are times when you will go through things. The Lord will punish you. He chastises those who he loves. So he will punish you, forgives you, and he sets you on a new course. In some cases, he sets you back on a course where he wanted you to take in the first place. Some people, they won't know what you went through for the Lord to get you through the mess, out of that bondage, and onto the path of freedom. And they will try to put you back in bondage. When the Israelites were liberated out of Egypt and they were wandering in the wilderness, they start craving the leeks and onions of their captivity. When you are set free, please be free. So again, Romans 8 verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit.